just start recording. At least, yeah. Okay. Okay now. Started, yeah, it started recording according to the. Okay. Shall I begin introduction, uh, Prof? If you like. Of course, of course, please. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. The uh, participants of today's seminar, and especially uh, uh, Prof. Osman, welcome to today's program. Um, actually, this today's seminar is going to be the last seminar of a uh, four, uh, let's say, seminar series. The first one was about uh, problem solving. Then we did uh, communication skills, and last week it was about innovation and creativity. And today's subject is uh, mass, uh, let's say media literacy uh, and uh, facts uh, reading, fact checking. Um, today's seminar is especially important because uh, we are living in the age of information and the social media platforms uh, have been developed in a way that it is encompassing all our lives all together. So we receive all kinds of information from all kinds of, let's say, social media and plus mass media, and let's call them all media altogether. And then I think it's important to understand how to read, uh, let's say, the news and everything given in, in media. And because uh, in, in many cases, we sometimes we found ourselves, uh, let's say, ridiculed and fooled very often because some maybe, uh, let's say, power groups are using social media and mass media to manipulate people's ideas, thoughts, and their preferences as well. I think in this regard, to read what we read correctly and come to a healthy conclusion requires uh, such kind of abilities and skills to, uh, let's say, improve our media literacy. In this regard, I'd like to uh, invite Mr. Professor Osman Kerolo to present his presentation uh, today about media literacy and fact checking. Yes, Prof, please, uh, stage is yours. Thank you uh, again for this chance. Uh, for me to share uh, the necessary informa information, maybe the essential information uh, for uh, our age and our times, uh, media literacy and fact checking. So let me share a little bit of information regarding my past and experiences. Uh, I had the experience of being a, an ICT or technology journalist, journalist uh, in Turkey mostly. Uh, for about 10 years and then I have the experience of being a full-time academician in different universities both in Turkey and abroad so uh, my main focus is new and emerging media and that involves of course uh, social media and mobile technologies and whatever new and whatever digital in terms of communication and media is what I am interested in, in terms of research and uh, teaching, basically. Uh, I am now currently the head of the Department of Mass Communication in Nile University of Nigeria. Uh, let's start. For some of you, time is important. Um, so that's why I decided to summarize most of the things regarding media literacy in six slides. So basically, if you uh, bear with me uh, for the next six uh, slides. You can learn uh, almost uh, everything regarding essentials of media literacy. And after that, you can leave, but uh, with the knowledge, with the full knowledge of how to apply these uh, things that we are going to discuss uh, to your everyday interactions with media. So let's talk about some core concepts and key questions. These are five things, five concepts, and five questions, key questions. The first, all media messages are constructed. Sometimes we tend to forget this. We uh, always uh, believe these make-believe things, these scenarios. Um, sometimes we don't um, really understand that there are people who are behind every news item, be it a video, be it a text, based uh, message coming from a journal, journalism um, organization, uh, and they all are constructed. And the question we need to ask, uh, the first question maybe for us, uh, who created this message? If we are unable to find out uh, who behind the message, uh, then we can uh, dismiss 
the quality, we can dismiss the uh, safety of the message, etc. cetera. Um, and the second issue, media messages are constructed using a creative language with its own rules, meaning uh, TV has its own rules, internet has its own rules, and uh, newspapers, magazines, they have their own rules. So basically we need to look at what techniques are used to attract my attention. How is it put together? Is it uh, uh, score, audio? Is it the flashy image? Is it the uh, specific noun or verb or something uh, that's uh, taking my attention and attracting my attention when I look at the headline, etc. So the third concept is different people experience the same media message differently. So what we need to ask about this is how might different people understand this message differently from me? Because uh, they have different uh, values, that they have different points of view, etc. And that's also true for the media organizations and uh, people, individuals working in those media organizations. And the fourth concept, core concept is media have embedded values and points of view. So what we need to ask is what lifestyles, values and points of view are represented in or the best uh, differentiator maybe omitted from this message. What kind of things are included and what kind of other things are omitted from this message? And the fifth core concept is media are organized to gain profit and or power. Basically, we need to ask why was this message sent? So uh, these are some key questions and core concepts, but we may ask uh, detailed questions regarding each of these. And for example, we may ask regarding the audience and authorship, uh, who made them this message? Why was this made? Who is the target audience? And how do you know who is the target audience? This is an important uh, thing to look. And economic side, who paid for this? Sometimes we see advertorials and uh, native advertisement. That's something new. Um, they may not include the exact name, but you can understand that this is the product uh, and this is something like a product review or a service review, but it is written by the journalist himself or herself. So it is a native advertisement. And we need to be able to uh, analyze who paid for this specific message and the impact, who might benefit from this message, who might be harmed by it, why might this message matter to me uh, specifically as an individual, and in terms of response, what kinds of actions might I take in response to this message? Sometimes uh, it was, uh, or it is a neutral message, but sometimes it asks us to do something, to go somewhere, to look at something, or to subscribe uh, an email newsletter, etc. In terms of messages and meanings, we can look at to, uh, the content, techniques and interpretations. In terms of content, we can look at the, what is this about? What makes you think that? And what ideas, values, information and or points of view are over or implied? This is a fair distinction. Um, if you are able to analyze the text itself or the image or video itself, the, the implied messages are important also uh, what is left out of this message that might be important to know? Uh, unless you know that specific part, you may have a bias against certain group of people or groups of people or certain things. So you need to be able to analyze that part also. So what techniques are used? Why were those techniques used? Um, I generally give this uh, simple um, example. When you are watching an advertisement, uh, try to 
uh, mute the TV and see if the impact of that advertisement will be the same. Mostly we uh, feel based on the score of the advertisement, based on the music, theme music of the advertisement. So how do they communicate the message? The techniques are important in this uh, part. Interpretations. This is about empathy and uh, understanding the psychology of the people and different so social groups, um, uh, positions about some issues. How might different people understand this same message differently? What's my in interpretation of this? And what do I learn about myself from my reaction or interpretation? And in terms of representations and reality, we can look at context and credibility. And the questions are, when was this made? Where and how was it shared with the public? And we are going to refer the, uh, these uh, things when we are talking about fact checking and uh, differentiating between the true and false or fake uh, versions of the same things. And credibility is another issue. Is this fact, opinion, or something else, something entirely different, uh, like misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, etc.? And how credible is this? And what makes us think that? What are the sources of the information, ideas, or assertions? We have these seven skills of media literacy. Let me just check. Okay. This is the last of the six um, slides that I mentioned. Uh, if you have these skills, basically, uh, and if you are able to ask the questions that we mentioned, uh, then you can easily say that I am a media literate person and I can understand what's behind the scenes of every media message or organization. Analysis, breaking down a message into meaningful elements. Evaluation, judging the value of the element, of a specific element of the message, and the judgment is made by comparing a message element to some standard. Uh, we need to be able to uh, find out what are the standards for specific things uh, inside the messages. Grouping, determining which elements are alike in some way, determining how a group of elements is different from other groups of elements. Induction, inferring a pattern across a small set of elements, then generalizing the pattern to all elements in the set. Uh, for example, we are uh, constantly bombarded with um, health-related news regarding COVID-19, and we can, at least I hope, um, uh, able to induce some of the things, um, some types of specific news regarding this uh, disease, pandemic, uh, uh, comparatively better than the um, time that we first face this uh, news. Detection, using general principles to explain particulars. Synthesis, assembling elements into a new structure. This is uh, something um, advanced in terms of media literacy. Uh, a media literate person, we are going to define this, uh, but let me just tell you something. Uh, a media literate person can be able to create effective messages based on truth, based on uh, copyrighted materials, etc. And abstracting, creating a brief, clear, and accurate description, capturing the essence of a message in a smaller number of words than the message itself. Basically, uh, did you understand the thing? And is it possible for you to summarize the message? Okay, let's look at this definition of the literacy. Literacy has always been a collection of communicative and sociocultural social -cultural practices shared among communities. As a uh, society and technology change, so does the literacy. The world demands that a literate person possess and intentionally apply a wide range of skills, competencies, and dispositions. These literacies are interconnected, dynamic, and malleable. Active, successful participants in a global society must be able to participate effectively and critically in a networked world, explore and engage critically, 
thoughtfully and across a wide variety of inclusive texts and tools or modalities. And they can consume, curate, and create actively across contexts, advocate for equitable access to and accessibility of texts, tools, and information, build and sustain intentional global and cross-cultural connections and relationships with others so as to pose and solve problems collaboratively and strengthen independent thought. They also promote culturally sustaining communication and recognize the bias and privilege present in the interactions. They examine the rights, responsibilities, and ethical implications of the use and creation of information. They determine how and to what extent texts and tools amplify one's own and others' narratives, as well as counter unproductive narratives. They recognize and understand the multilingual literacy identities and culture experiences individuals bring to learning environments and provide opportunities to promote, amplify, and encourage these differing variations of language. <coughs> okay, let's consider some of these questions. Do we select, and uh, let me tell you something regarding these questions. These are the important questions for you to be able to say that I'm a literate person, not just media literacy in general. Uh, if you are able to say that, yes, I do, yes, I am, uh, to uh, these questions as the answers, then you can easily say that I am a literate, I am a media literate person. Do we select, evaluate, and use digital tools and resources that match the work we are doing? Are we critical, savvy, producers and consumers? Do we build and utilize a network of groups and individuals that reflect varying views as we analyze, create, and remix texts? Do we analyze information for authorial intent, positioning, and how language, visuals, and audio are being used? Do we find relevant and reliable sources that meet our needs? Do we take risks and try new things with tools available to us? Do we independently and collaboratively persist in solving problems as we arise in our work? Etc. Etc. These are all regarding the literacies, different types of literacies. Um, and in general, it is, of course, about the media literacy because the information we generally consume um, coming from the media. And let me tell you what media is. Media is basically anything that contains an information and delivers to other people coming from a source, uh, meaning transfer. If it is um, providing a meaning, then it is a media. That's a, a very general description of what media is. Um, do we gain new perspectives? Uh, do, we gain, uh, do we deepen understandings, develop new skills, analyze and evaluate the multimedia sources? Uh, do we examine the credibility and relevancy of sources? Do we consider the author purpose and design of information? Do we review a variety of sources to evaluate information as we consider bias and, and perspective in sources? Do we evaluate content we find online before sharing with others? This is a huge problem in terms of misinformation, disinformation, and propaganda campaigns. Uh, people, uh, without um, understanding what they are doing, they uh, automatically share content. And sometimes, most of the time, let me say, uh, most of the time, they share misinformation, disinformation, and propaganda material uh, without noticing even. Okay, what else we can focus? Okay, do we use tools to communicate original perspectives and to make new thinking visible? Uh, okay. Do we share and publish original content with a consideration of the intended audience? This is, as you see, media literacy or in general literacy becomes un with the understanding and then uh, goes uh, towards creating the specific content or the message in an efficient way. And that's why these types of questions 
um, go uh, towards these uh, do we share and publish original content kind of uh, questions. Do we recognize information gaps or information poverty? Do we attain a greater understanding of text through accessible text structures? Do we use visual cues to support our reading of the text? Do we access digital texts that adhere to web accessibility principles? All of these are related to the literacies that's expected uh, from a person living in this century, in this time. And uh, I'm going to share this, uh, these slides with the people who attended. So uh, don't worry about uh, taking notes, etc. You're not going to lose anything. So what is media literacy? Media literacy empowers people to be both critical thinkers and creative producers of an increasingly wide range of messages using image, language, and sound. It is the skillful application of literacy skills to media and technology messages. And as communication technologies transform society, they impact our understanding of ourselves, our communities, and our diverse cultures, making media literacy an essential life skill for the 21st century. Again, it consists of a series of communication competencies, including the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, and communicate information in a variety of forms. Being literate in a media age requires critical thinking skills, which empower us as we make decisions, whether in the classroom, the living room, the workplace, the boardroom, or the voting booth. Okay. We talked about what it is, now what it is not. Media bashing is not media literacy. However, media literacy sometimes involves criticizing the media. Merely producing media is not media literacy, although media literacy should include media production at the end. And just teaching with multimedia content is not media literacy. One must also teach about media itself. Simply looking for political agendas, stereotypes, or misrepresentations is not media literacy. There should also be an exploration of the systems, making those representations appear normal. Looking at a media message or a mediated experience from just one perspective is not media literacy, because media should be examined from multiple positions. We mentioned uh, while we were talking about the five important um, questions, key questions regarding media literacy. And media literacy does not mean don't watch. It means watch carefully, think critically. This is an important thing, especially if you have a family, if you have children and uh, you are consuming or you are letting them consume um, audiovisual messages, you need to somehow let them watch carefully and think critically by uh, providing them examples by asking questions regarding the information they or the content they uh, are uh, somehow facing. Media literacy is a serious and significant endeavor. At stake is the empowerment of individuals, especially in some societies, minorities, and the strengthening of society's democratic structures. If you are after democracy, if you are uh, into a democracy, of course. Uh, why I'm telling you this is when you look at the general situation all around the world, if a country is governed by an autocratic um, uh, government, let's say, then you are most likely to see that there are no media literacy education whatsoever uh, in all of the curriculums uh, of that specific country. Uh, and media is um, sometimes um, created by the government and only by the government. So media literacy is that of representation. The media mediate. They do not reflect, but represent the world. The media are symbolic sign systems that must be decoded by individuals, us. And this is something of a bummer, I know. 
we all like to learn things as soon as possible and uh, get the certificate and be done with those types of things. But media literacy uh, education is a lifelong process because uh, you understand better and better every day when you practice these things. And media literacy aims to foster not simply critical intelligence, but critical autonomy in terms of individual um, lifestyles and individual's freedom. And it is investigative. It does not seek to impose specific cultural or political values. The effectiveness of media literacy can be evaluated by just two criteria. A, the ability of students to apply their critical thinking to new situations and B, the amount of commitment and motivation displayed by students themselves. So we need to understand one thing regarding media literacy and fact checking. We need to be able to at least uh, have the basics of the critical thinking. Whenever humans reason, they have no choice but to use certain predictable structures of thought. Thinking is inevitably driven by the questions. We seek answers to questions for some purpose. To answer questions, we need information. To use information, we must interpret it by making inferences. And our inferences, in turn, are based on assumptions and have implications, all of which involves ideas or concepts within some point of view. We have these thinker uh, types, basically uh, beginning from the childhood, we uh, are passing and uh, most of us uh, stuck um, at probably practicing thinker or beginning thinker level, unless we deliberately, deliberately work towards achieving the master thinker position. And I'm going to give you some details regarding these. And uh, we all assume that thinking is the thing that we are doing uh, and it is something normal. No, it isn't something normal. Uh, we need to learn how to think. And basically the education, at least um, uh, in terms of its definition, provides this uh, ability of thinking skill. Uh, let's look at the details. Six levels of critical thinkers, thinkers, unreflective, challenged, beginning, practicing, advanced, and master. Okay, stage one. These people are uh, people who don't reflect about thinking and the effect it has on their lives. As such, they form opinions and make decisions based on prejudices and misconceptions while their thinking doesn't improve. Uh, unreflective thinkers lack crucial skills that would allow them to parse their thought processes. They also do not apply standards like accuracy, relevance, precision, and logic in a consistent fashion. How many such people are out there, do you think? You probably can guess based on social media comments of people. It is perfectly possible for students to graduate from high school or even college and still be largely unreflective thinkers. And the stage two challenged thinker, this next level of up thinker has awareness of the importance of thinking on their existence and knows that deficiencies in thinking can bring about major issues. As the psychologists explain, to solve a problem, you must first admit you have one. People at this intellectual stage begin to understand that high quality thinking requires deliberate, reflective thinking about thinking and can acknowledge that their own mental processes might have many flaws. They might not be able to identify all the flaws, however. A challenged thinker may have a sense that solid thinking involves navigating assumptions, inferences, and points of view, but only on an initial level. They may also be able to spot some instances of their own self-deception. The true difficulty for thinkers of this category is in not believing that their thinking is better than it actually is, making it more difficult to recognize the problems inherent in poor thinking. Stage three, the beginning thinker. At this level, 
they can go beyond the nascent intellectual humility and actively look to take control of their thinking across areas of their lives. They know that their own thinking can have blind spots and other problems and take steps to address those, but in a limited capacity. Beginning thinkers place more value in reason, becoming self-aware in their thoughts. They may also be able to start looking at the concepts and biases underlying their ideas. Additionally, such thinkers develop higher internal standards of clarity, accuracy, and logic, realizing that their ego plays a key role in their decisions. Another big aspect that differentiates this stronger thinker, some ability to take criticism of their mental approach, even though they still have work to do and might lack clear enough solutions to the issues they spot. The practicing thinker, this more experienced kind of thinker, not only appreciates their own deficiencies, but has skills to deal with them. A thinker of this level will practice better thinking habits and will analyze their mental processes with regularity. While they might be able to express their mind's strengths and weaknesses as a negative, practicing thinkers might still not have a systematic way of gaining insight into their thoughts and can fall prey to egocentric and self-deceptive reasoning. Stage four, so we are still talking about stage four. How do you get to this stage? An important trait to gain is intellectual perseverance. This quality can provide the impetus for developing a realistic plan for systematic practice with a view to taking greater command of one's thinking. Now, stage five, the advanced thinker. One doesn't typically get to this stage until college and beyond, estimate the scientists, this higher level thinker would have strong habits that would allow them to analyze their thinking with insight about different areas of life. They would be fair-minded and able to spot the prejudicial aspects in the points of view of others and their own understanding. While they had gone, have a good handle on the role of their ego in the idea flow, such thinkers might still not be able to grasp all the influences that affect their mentality. And the advanced thinker is at ease with self-critic and does so systematically, looking to improve. Among key traits required for this level are intellectual insight to develop new thought habits, intellectual integrity to recognize areas of inconsistency and contradiction in one's life, intellectual empathy to put oneself in the place of others in order to genuinely understand them, and the intellectual courage to confront ideas and beliefs they don't necessarily believe in and have negative emotions towards. And stage six, the master thinker. This is the super thinker, the one who is totally in control of how they process information and make decisions. Such people constantly seek to improve their thought skills and through experience regularly raise their thinking to the level of conscious realization. A master thinker achieves great insights into deep mental levels, strongly committed to being fair and gaining control over their own egocentrism. Such a high level thinker also exhibits superior practical knowledge and insight, always re-examining their assumptions for weaknesses, logic, and biases. And of course, a master thinker wouldn't get upset with being intellectually confronted and spends a considerable amount of time analyzing their own responses. We need to understand this. The human mind left to its own pursues that which is immediately easy, that which is comfortable, that which serves its selfish interests. At the same time, it naturally resists that which is difficult to understand, that which involves complexity, that which requires entering the thinking and predicaments of others. If you are into these stuff, please check cognitive biases and logical fallacies. If you search these two keywords, cognitive biases and logical fallacies, you are going to be able to understand what is necessary for you to be able to think more clearly than what you are doing now. And this is a, an example 
cognitive bias codex, you can uh, also search for these uh, types of um, infographics that summarizes things. And most of the time, these types of infographics provide uh, the general uh, survey of the uh, thing that you are searching. Uh, cognitive bias context, I also recommend this. And uh, there, there are websites regarding fallacies, logical fallacies, and one of these is your bias that is. Your bias that is a, a good website regarding these logical fallacies, and you can download these types of posters from this website and understand. These are the um, most important cognitive biases uh, that stuffs up our thinking. And we have another website regarding um, fallacies, logical fallacies, and it is your fallacy that is. And you can also look at these information from that site, your fallacy that is. Okay, let's start the fact checking part. When we say fact checking, uh, we mean the process of verifying information in non-fictional text in order to determine its veracity and correctness. So we may have fact checking before or after the text uh, is published or otherwise disseminated. When we are telling, uh, when we are saying text, we also mean audiovisuals, graphics, etc., uh, the multimedia. And internal fact checking is uh, done in house by the publisher or broadcaster. And the uh, external fact checking can be done uh, by anyone, uh, by a third party after the publication or the broadcast. Globally, we have this, uh, these huge numbers. The total current output of data is roughly 2.5 quintillion bytes, or the equivalent of the content of the Library of Congress 250,000 times over each day. And this is a huge, huge number. And uh, this is uh, statistics. Uh, this year, uh, the, I reached this information uh, from a 2020 publication. And adults in the United States today spend an average of 11 hours per day interacting with media. Basically, uh, if they're not asleep, they're interacting with media. And we are going to talk about this in terms of our own lives. Uh, let's look at this. Evil travels faster. Technologies that provides access to all kinds of information also makes it ever easier for falsehoods, slander, prejudices and bad ideas to travel much faster and farther than ever before. How we can identify misinformation, blunt its effects on us and prevent it from spreading. How we can detect and fight propaganda that's spreading throughout the information ecosystem that we are in. We are going to outline how journalism has changed as it confronts the digital age and why this impacts our ability to access reliable factual information. And we're going to delve into various ways that information can be manipulated and why the wiring of our brains makes us susceptible to manipulative information. We're going to talk about some practical skills, including a technique to assess information consumption, tools and skills for visual and textual verification, and a powerful method to resist having your rational brain hijacked by provocative content, like propaganda content. At the end, we are going to talk about how to better assess science and health news and look toward the future at the evolving types of manipulative content we might face. Uh, I hope, this is my hope, you will leave this seminar empowered with a critical perspective on misinformation and how it functions in society today and an understanding of the range of tools and tactics you can use to fight it. Misinformation threat. Misinformation can travel quickly through communities that don't have strong enough 
protections in place, causing really real world harm. Uh, unfortunately, we see this um, in all of the all around the world, uh, especially about uh, pandemic um, diseases, etc. Unfortunately, there is nothing as straightforward as a vaccine to protect people from the dangers of misinformation. It takes more than one simple action. It takes awareness, focus, and skill building. However, it is possible to build up resilience to the dangers of misinformation. What is misinformation? It simply refers to incorrect or misleading information, while disinformation is information that is false and deliberately created to cause harm. It can be hard to identify what the intent was when we are facing a message or a new um, or media message. So it's generally more accurate to use the word misinformation as an umbrella term. We have seven types of problematic content and we're going to talk about them. The first type is satire or parody, which has no intention to cause harm, but has potential to fool at least some of the people. <clears throat> False connections, which occur when headlines, visuals, or captions don't support the content. Misleading content, which involves the misleading use of information to frame an issue or individual. False context, which is when genuine content is shared with false contextual information. Imposter content, which is generated when genuine news sources are impersonated. Manipulated content, which is generated when genuine information or imagery is manipulated to deceive. Fabricated content, which is new content that is entirely false and designed to deceive and do harm. So, true elements mix with false elements to create a confusing and powerful piece of misinformation. And there's another issue regarding hate speech, and it is bigoted content that attacks a person or identity group based on that identity, whether it involves race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, belief systems, or other attributes. Propaganda is crafted with the intent to persuade people of a particular idea or point of view. Disinformation involves deliberate falsehoods intended to cause harm. And according to the research, uh, youth, youth are easily fooled by misinformation, especially when it comes through social media channels. Um, when we mention youth, we should also mention um, older adults. Uh, people over 65 shared seven times as much misinformation on Facebook as their younger counterparts. So uh, we need to be also careful. Let's do this small exercise on media consumption. If it is possible for you to do that, please do so. Take out a piece of paper and a pen or open the Notes app on your phone. Alternatively, you can also just think through this exercise, that's okay. List all of the media that you use or take in during your daily life. And when uh, do you use, when do you take that specific media uh, message, when do you consume? For example, maybe you watch a television show in the morning and listen to a podcast later in the day, or you are listening uh, radio, etc. Also take into consideration factors like checking your email, texting people and interacting with social media platforms. The goal here is to try to create a detailed portrait of a typical day, not just what you consume, but also how much time you spend doing it. Now think about the devices you use regularly to consume the media you prefer. This includes cell phones, computers, tablets and television. You might also use books, magazines and uh, the car radio. Based on what you have found so far, try to add up the total number of hours you spend on media each day. Uh, please remember, uh, US, a typical US adult, United States adult, uh, spends 11 hours each day uh, consuming media. 
what percentage of your waking hours do you spend using different types of media? And let me ask you, does the result surprise you? For example, for me, if I'm awake uh, as a person, I'm either using my phone or my computer. Uh, so that's basically uh, almost always, unless of course I'm eating or I'm uh, playing with my son, etc. Next, let's ask ourselves, how much trust are we placing in the sources of information we use? How much do you really know about the entities that produce the content we are consuming? The sheer quantity of information we are surrounded with can affect our ability to discern its quality. We need reliable reporting, the kind that skillful journalists do. Yet the digital platforms where we get our information, basically social media, make it harder and harder to distinguish journalists from activists, lone individuals with political agendas, and even outright spreaders of disinformation. This is a definition. Journalism is the activity of gathering, assessing, creating, and presenting news and information. It is also the product of these activities. And they don't mention professionalism, right? They don't mention the uh, money-making part. So basically, someone who's not doing, um, uh, who's not gaining money out of this uh, practice or these practices may also do journalism. Uh, gathering, assessing, creating, and presenting news and information and the product of these activities. So, news or opinion. Basically, this is a rule for every journalist all around the world. News pieces should be made up of facts. Their main point is to inform the reader or listener or the audience. And opinion should be kept separate from news and it should be clearly labeled. The pillars of ethics and or uh, the rules of ethics may uh, differ from one uh, country to another, but these are generally accepted as the uh, same thing for everyone. Seek the truth and report it. Seek to minimize harm. Act independently. Be accountable and transparent. Basically, in the modern media landscape, the traditional media still reporting but with multimedia formats. Um, we have new um, entities like news aggregators. Uh, these are sites, websites that operate as news aggregators, uh, pulling news from different sources. And Google News, uh, have you ever used? I'm not sure. Um, Google News is one example. And there are different types of news aggregators that combine news, pull news from different sources and provide the person who's interested that specific type of content. And we are going to mention filter bubble and this is an important thing. An example of traditional media reporting using social media is, for example, CNN. A traditional broadcaster sending out information as short posts on Twitter. And there is something else called bot reporting uh, bots are a type of application, a software application, that tells computers to do very simple tasks automatically and repetitively and much faster than a person could do. The drawback is that bot reporting only works for simple things. For instance, a bot cannot write a report that provides context or analysis. Uh, not yet anyway, because artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities of these types of bots are uh, getting stronger and stronger. Uh, for structured news like um, uh, economic news, uh, economic data, uh, based on economic data, it is possible for a bot to create structured news uh, because it is uh, basically about the shares of the companies, etc., etc. Uh, statistics coming from a source, and the bot may analyze that and put specific things in specific parts of the same report and update the report regularly. We have tweet storms or now Twitter threads. Uh, this is 
a thread uses a series of number tweets that are linked in some way to show a narrative. And social media's sources, over time, more and more credible news sources, including traditional media, have begun sourcing stories from social media. And even some outlets have called out directly to their audiences for input. And uh, I may just mention some um, like BBC, CNN, and Al Jazeera. They, uh, they all have different ways for you uh, to support them doing uh, quality journalism by providing them participatory information regarding uh, specific issues, specific topics. Basically, what you are doing is sending information, a photograph, a text, an email, and then uh, they just analyze that. And if they see that's worth searching, uh, if they see that it is newsworthy, then they can um, use their resources, their uh, staff, to get more information regarding that issue. And we have algorithms. This is a huge topic in terms of new and emerging media studies. Uh, this is computer code. This is a computer code that makes decisions about what appears in people's feeds based on what they have liked, commented on, and shared. And algorithms are also behind the search uh, engines. And when you search something, you see specific things. Uh, compared to my search result, the same keyword. Uh, basically, if I search, uh, for example, sports, I see different things than any one of you uh, because of your preferences. Filter bubble. Um, recently, I learned something regarding this, but um, we need to uh, verify that. Uh, unless people make a conscious, conscious, conscious decision to seek out new types of content and perspectives other than those they agree with, they may find themselves trapped in a virtual community of only like-minded people. This is an accepted truth. This was an accepted truth uh, for the last, uh, let's say, 10 years. Uh, uh, the thing is, uh, the algorithms are changing and adapting. Uh, so that people may um, see other points of view, other things that they don't really generally prefer to see. <clears throat> so that's uh, changing, uh, but uh, we don't see much change, much big change. So we can still accept that this is the truth. There is something called filter bubble and we are living inside filter bubbles, uh, each of us. Custom search result, we mentioned this. Um, de uh, it depends on your past search history, what you have clicked on, and your overall digital habits. And uh, sometimes people don't understand this, and they accept that when you search something, you see the same results with uh, everyone else. But that's not the truth. Um, uh, and we need to consider this a problem, basically because uh, truth is out there, and when we search, we may not find the truth. Misinformation and the brain. Um, we mentioned about biases. We mentioned about fallacies, logical fallacies, and human beings are hardwired to view the world in certain ways. Uh, the biases are the way we judge ideas, how we make decisions, and our motivations to act are fraught with all kinds of biases and they provide basically um, efficiency for operations that we do daily. However, they can be deliberately exploited through the use of misinformation to catch our attention, sway our opinions or sow doubt and confusion. And uh, uh, the United States uh, saw this uh, in 2016 elections and they are still unable to recover uh, this uh, situation. When people want to believe in what they hear or read, their brains ignore a large amount of information, focusing only on the information that confirms the prediction. This is a huge problem, but uh, we all have this problem. Uh, selective recall, people tend to remember the things that support their point of view and disregard the rest 
confirmation bias. People search for and notice only the information that confirms their position. Um, think about your uh, online activities and your political views, your um, points of view regarding specific issues. Is it possible for you to search different things and notice different things? Of course it is possible, but it is harder for you to do that. Instead, you search specific things that's likely for you to accept and notice things that's likely for you uh, to accept and confirm your position. An emotional reaction issue. We have an affinity for stories and the emotional reactions that they produce in us um, can draw us into new stories and uh, compel us to educate ourselves about what is happening in the world. However, it can also make us vulnerable to manipulation. The people who create content are often trying to provoke a strong reaction in you, be it sadness, be it anger, or resentment, or I don't know, whatever you uh, need to feel uh, at that moment, according to the people who created that specific content. But the thing is, decision is ours. It is up to us whether and how we act on a piece of information. Uh, and we mostly see this uh, in the use and abuse of headlines, uh, clickbait, basically. Clicking on a link means that the link has captured our attention and it potentially has also generated advertising revenue for the people. Clickbait means a manipulative headline, headline and uh, those headlines provoke curiosity to get our clicks and they are everywhere. This is an interesting thing, brain hacking. Maybe you noticed this, maybe you were suspecting this kind of a thing, but couldn't uh, put your finger on it. Uh, this is a technology that uh, companies employ to keep people hooked on their devices. Uh, for the mobile phones, it is the uh, color and constant notifications. These two are the important technologies. And there is, after, uh, for example, Android 10, Mm. there's a um, setting regarding um, wind down I guess that it is called it automatically uh, changes your screen colors into black and white and uh, it prevents some of the notifications and this is something good for your brain health and there are psychologist designers in tech companies employed and they employ these people to inform digital designs that keep people engaged digitally and form habits that are hard to break. Uh, they are studying human psychology to understand better and to let people continue using the services, the products, the devices, uh, the social media, etc. So, uh, some key characteristics of manipulation in terms of manipulative content, the triggering of fear, hurling insults, or employing insinuation, exaggeration, or distraction. Often, these types of manipulative content uh, presents opinions as fact. It can also include facts mixed together with falsehoods, exaggerations of facts that aren't related but are made to seem so and manipulation often deploys symbols that play on our emotions such as the flag of our country and utilizes stereotypes and constant repetition is another manipulative tactic because after some time we accept it as something normal even if we don't uh, believe that, even if we don't logically accept that, that is the truth, we accept it, something, uh, something normal. So how can we have this resilience against manipulation? Take a minute to identify your emotional reaction. This can help us avoid falling for content that might not be true. The key idea is 
to diffuse our own immediate emotional response so that our, um, we can engage our critical thinking skills. This is an important thing. We are going to mention this uh, at least two times or more. Label to disable. First, we need to pause, close our eyes or turn our head away from the source that we are discussing, the media message, the social media message <coughs> or the notification. And then we need to ask ourselves, what am I feeling? Uh, put words to the reaction. This, uh, just, is it anger? Is it wonder? Is it amazement? Uh, say, finally, say the label that you've given the feeling to yourself. Uh, anger. When you say that, you notice that when you read that specific thing or watch that specific thing, uh, it angered you. Then you can understand that the message is trying to anger you or the producer of the content is trying to anger you, for example. And this is another thing, and we are going to mention maybe once more this uh, before the end of this presentation. Uh, care before you share. We need to take responsibility because we are the information gatekeeper at the time when we are about to share something. It is up to us, uh, it is um, up to us not to spread that misinformation. And the second issue is acknowledging what we may not know. We need to be extra careful with content that appeals to us, supports what we already believe or provokes a strong reaction in us. If we have time, we need to check it out. We need to do whatever we can do to verify the information. If we are still not sure it is true, we don't share it. That's uh, the end of it. If it isn't true or if we are not sure, we don't share it. So, visual misinformation, three kinds, reuse and mislabeling, photo selection effect, and deliberate alteration or forgery. In terms of reuse and mislabeling, people can simply download an image and add text to it, text that labels or describes a picture or video, directs people how to see it and can significantly shape perceptions of the situation described in that specific picture or video. Uh, people may perceive something different than what is there. Selection, choosing only to use certain photos and not others can misrepresent a situation. And photos can, be, can also be selectively cropped uh, to show only some part of it. Videos can be selectively edited to show only parts of it and leaving a false impression at the end. Deliberate alteration of forgery, we are going to mention deep fake videos eventually. Uh, many such photos and videos emerge out of current events and breaking news situations. When tensions are high and people are clamoring for information, forgers are eager to exploit the emotions that people have in response to such events. To protect yourself, uh, from the effects of these types of provocative things, we can use label to disable technique we talked. First pause and then ask yourself, what am I feeling? And then finally say the label that you felt. Uh, verifying images. If you are suspicious, uh, you should examine it closely. Look for any elements that seem out of place, like what, you may ask. Uh, for example, the shadows. Do the shadows all point in the same direction or do some seem inconsistent with others? Uh, or, for example, signage in the photo. If there's a signage in the photo, what language is it written in? And is it the same language or a different one? Is it appropriate to the location supposedly shown in the image? And we have some tools like Google Images reverse image search, or TINI. Again, uh, you can either upload, paste, or enter the image URL and search how many other images related to that specific image are there online. Uh, they both allow you 
to compare an image to others like it on the internet to see what may have changed and the first image that comes online uh, similar to that image. Or we have photoforensics.com. After we upload a photo or enter a URL, the site will analyze the photo and can detect places where the photograph may have been tampered with. Or we have this Inuit project. And this is a, actually a plugin for browsers, Chrome or Firefox browser, and they, it can help analyze video or a photo. Digital tools and techniques change quickly. A tool may quickly become improved, replaced by something else, or suddenly obsolete. Tools can be great, but there is no substitute for our own good judgment. In terms of me media, take uh, information coming from media. We have three species of fake information. Fake social media accounts, fake chat messages, or fake reviews. Uh, reasons for people to spread these types of things, uh, political, financial, and recreational, and what we can do. First, of course, label to disable, uh, to regain our control of our logical brain, and then we can look at the profile. Did the user join recently to the social media? Do the user's photo, handle, and screen name match? Or do you find, for example, a women's picture with a man's name? Or, for example, a certain keyword plus a lot of numbers? If it is that kind of a um, handle, then you can easily say that this is a different types of, type of a person or maybe a bot or a troll. Discrepancies could signal that you are dealing with a bot. Okay, in some cases, a fake name may be almost indistinguishable from a real one. But we can also search some other things like a reverse image search on the profile photo. But there, there is a problem with that. Many fake profiles steal photos from real people. We can notice that uh, unless, of course, they use artificially generated fake photos. Uh, there are websites that use artificial intelligence to generate fake photos of um, people who are uh, not alive or who are not around the earth, basically. <clears throat> and we can also compare followers or shares, the number of users followed or shares to the number of followers or friends. Uh, if, a, if an account follows thousands of users or has thousands of shares, but only has a handful of followers or friends, it could be a bot. If we're not sure, then we shouldn't share. Fake chat messages easy uh, to create, are easy to create. Um, employ, we are going to employ, of course, the able to disable. Then we need to ask ourselves, how would someone have obtained this specific chat? Are these really things that these people would likely to say? If not, don't share the chat. And we have another issue regarding fake product reviews. Be aware that most reviews are not fake, actually. And uh, there are some fake reviews come from, coming from commercial companies themselves as they try to promote what they are selling or producing or uh, servicing. What we need to do is we need to ask does the language of the review sound unnatural? Uh, does it sound like it was taken from uh, marketing material? Or are there non-obvious terms used in multiple reviews as if those reviewers are following the same script? Do the positive reviews all cluster around a small stretch of time within, for example, a day or a week? Are there many reviews from new accounts are the reviews more clustered mostly around perfect and terrible ratings with very few in the middle? This is a trouble. Normally, uh, normal distribution is a statistical term that we should be able to see uh, in terms of uh, product reviews or service reviews. Play the numbers game, meaning trust the product with many reviews averaging four stars. Uh, over one that boasts five stars but only has a handful of reviewers. 
we also need to keep in mind that people do tend to complain more than they praise. So we need to take negative reviews with a grain of salt. Finally, we need to be very aware of using reviews to make decisions that require better evidence. For instance, it might not be worth taking a dietary supplement that, might, that may have dangerous side effects simply because it has positive reviews. <clears throat> so journalistic verification skills are what is needed actually for everyone. It is neither desirable nor possible to check out all the information that comes our way, but sometimes we, need, we may need to check specific things and we need to be able to do that using these kinds of things. Uh, there's no simple trick, but cross-checking is important basically comparing the information we have found to the information about the same topic in different sources to see whether all the sources describe it in the same way. And for that, we need to search, of course, but we need to skip any advertisements that come up and go beyond the first few results and see if there are supporting evidence. <clears throat> and we can use, of course, Google, our uh, trusty search engine, but the thing is Google provides um, a different type of result for us than our friends. So basically we need to do, we, what we need to do is we need to use DuckDuckGo. Uh, this is another search engine, but it doesn't collect any data from the users that search on it, meaning that searches are not tailored and that your data is not sold to advertisers. Uh, in terms of objectivity, DuckDuckGo is better. And let me tell you one thing, DuckDuckGo is using Google's search technology. Uh, but uh, what it basically does is it provides a filter behind uh, to not to let Google receive the information from the user. Lateral reading, the skill that fact checkers use. Look at which sites link to the site under examination. Are they reliable? Do they confirm the information? Wikipedia is a good starting point for cross-checking and lateral reading. Even if some of the lecturers, some of the people, professionals don't agree with this, uh, basically Wikipedia is the encyclopedia of our day. So we need to be able to at least analyze um, what types of Wikipedia content are better in terms of um, cross-checking uh, and why, uh, how it works, etc. And trace the origin of the claim if uh, we are trying to find out the origin. Um, we are trying to verify from website to website until we find its original source. Look up the website where the piece that we want to verify appeared for insights into their expertise as well as potentially ulterior motives for publishing or broadcasting the content. For that, we need to understand who runs, who runs a website. And for that, we need to use quiz search. And the most important place for us to do that is ICANN. It is an international organization, a nonprofit organization uh, regarding these types of things. Uh, and you can just search I can work and then use who is function to look at the details of a specific domain name. Plagiarism, it is the representation of another author's language, thoughts, ideas, or expressions as one's own original work. It is considered academic dishonesty and a breach of journalistic ethics. We are of course talking about journalism part here, we need to check, search, and go back and find the original publication date. And we need to be able to reach the archive.org, which is the internet archive. And we can use uh, its Wayback machine, basically the historical archive of specific web pages. Almost every web page you can uh, search and find. And go back and find content that might have been changed or even deleted to see when something was originally published. And abuse of statistics is another issue. 
when we face a statistic, we need to ask these types of things, these questions. Does the statistic seem too good to be true? It may well be. That is a good clue for us to check it out. Uh, think about the numbers involved. Do they support the argument being made? Do they make sense? If a link or name of a source document organization is given in the article where the stat appears, we need to cross check or we need to click the link or use search to try to find the document in question uh, and review the source document to substantiate whether it says what the article claims it says. And use lateral reading to learn about the author or source of the article, then ask ourselves, does the author or source organization have the authority and expertise to provide that information? Search the web or organization's website for additional information. If we still have doubts, try to identify a reputable source for checking the information elsewhere. And I seek is an example uh, of a specialized search engine that allows us to look across thousands of pre-approved sources, including universities, governments, nonprofits, uh, on a wide variety of academic topics. When we face science and health news, uh, we need to understand that scientific knowledge is always changing. New discoveries are constantly rendering previous beliefs obsolete. So what we can do uh, is we need to understand the news media do not always do a good job of explaining scientific findings or putting them in proper context. So what is the scientific method normally? We need to understand this. Uh, the scientist finds a topic or question worth exploring and do some initial background research to learn about uh, his or her topic or question, read what has been written before, and then come up with a hypothesis uh, this is his or her best guess of what happened, what is happening, or what will happen based on what you, uh, what he or she already know. And then uh, they test their hypothesis, uh, do this by collecting data, either through controlled experimentation or observation or secondary uh, sources. And they look at and analyze their data based on their analysis, either accept or reject their hypothesis and then publish their information, including all relevant details on how they collected and analyzed their data. So the thing is, uh, in the old days, uh, the publications, the journals, uh, were only accepting the uh, article itself, the academic article itself, but now they're also asking the data regarding the research, including the Excel files, statistical database files, and whatever uh, is possible for you to provide. And there are specific repositories that provide database of these um, uh, data, research data, uh, be it visual, audiovisual, or textual, whatever kind. You can upload those data and then uh, provide uh, the people who are going to check your article and read your article and analyze uh, the data. Uh, at a later time to show that you are an honest researcher and based on this specific data, you created this article, you published this article. Uh, when we are facing health news or science news, we need to ask these, uh, or we need to try to understand these. Does the story use hyperbolic language, meaning, Rarely do scientific studies yield true breakthrough, revolutionary, or game-changing treatments. Science tends to gain knowledge in small steps. Also, we need to understand uh, what other studies have been done. Good scientific research takes account of the work of others. It might support that work or challenge it, but it doesn't ignore it. And the sample size is important. What was the sample size? We need to be able to see from the news. Uh, if this was a health study, how many people participated in it? Statistically, data from hundreds or thousands of people is generally more reliable than data from just a few people. And this is another issue, mice or people. Did the study involve mice or people? Many medical studies are conducted on rodents first. 
this lays the groundwork for human studies, but a shortened effect in mice may not appear in people. And this is another thing, causation or correlation. Do the reported findings show causation or mere correlation? Two things can be correlated or systematically associated without one causing the other. And cost and availability is another issue for us to check if the story is about a medical treatment, does it talk about cost and availability? If a treatment is too expensive for most people to use, it may not make much difference. And benefits and harms, another point of view we need to understand, does the story provide details on a treatment's benefits and harms? How effective is the treatment? Is it quantified? What are the side effects? What about potential interactions with other drugs? If these are not mentioned, the article isn't very trustworthy. And this is what some uh, journalists or news organizations are doing, disease mongering. Is the story engaging in disease mongering? Sometimes the story will exaggerate the severity of a condition or medicalize what is actually a normal state of health. And reputable scientific journal is the article based on a research that was published in a reputable scientific journal because they uh, have a rigorous review process to try and make sure studies were carried out well and results are accurate. However, just as there are fake news publishers, there are fake journals, academic journals also. And this is an important thing because uh, if you ask this question, who funded the research, uh, please do remember the first few slides uh, on media literacy, the first few questions about this. Who funded the research? Who funded, who's behind this news, basically? Um, for example, we have some uh, news campaigns or um, public relations campaigns that support uh, that tobacco use, cigarettes are healthier products or healthy products. Uh, basically around 50s, 60s, we have these types of um, news messages when we search. And most of these research or these types of things are supported by the tobacco companies. Uh, at a later point, uh, investigators found out. So technology, misinformation, and the future. When we look at these, uh, we see that a misinformation arms race is continually underway. For example, we have deep fake videos. These are videos that can be used to make people look like they are saying something they never actually said to a very high degree of realism. And let me tell you, the technology behind these deep fake videos are um, advancing uh, very rapidly uh, because the technology is based on machine learning and artificial intelligence and while we are sleeping the computers are constantly working towards uh, betterment of their methods the artificial intelligence has also made it possible to create fake audio fake human face photos and to quickly generate fake text in the style of a particular individual. So we need to use label to disable, pose, ask, and say, what do you feel? If the content is dubious, we do not create or share, make a commitment not to create or share these kinds of things, dubious information. And we need to understand that we are living in information bubbles, we need to try to break our information bubble and try to reach others, different ideas, try to understand others. And if it is possible for us, I know it is possible. Finally, we need to do a digital detox, spend at least one day a week away from screens and the internet, try a social media fast, or take a vacation from all things digital, at least one day, if it is possible for you. Um, these are some of the fact-checking resources. You can look at them um, and you can try to uh, understand how they work. Uh, most of them agree on specific news stories in terms of uh, the truth uh, about these news stories, but sometimes they 
use different types of questions. They use different types of resources to check the veracity of those news items. So it is uh, better for us to use multiple sources to understand the truth behind a specific story news. And these are the references. I can say that if you want to understand better the media literacy issue, you need to refer to the book with the same name uh, coming from Sage Publications. This is a textbook. And if you are looking to understand um, in terms of uh, the fact checking issues, etc., you may refer to the uh, Audible and you can find Fighting Misinformation is one of the uh, teaching companies uh, good lectures and uh, you can listen to that and there are many many resources for you to check if you are after these types of things uh, thank you for your attendance and if you have questions i can try to answer your questions now Thank you very much, uh, Prof, for this uh, highly uh, sophisticated and educative and uh, horizon broadening and beneficial uh, presentation. And I think I, uh, I can say that uh, media literacy is one of the 21st century skills that all of us should possess, um, not to be fooled and not to be manipulated. Even uh, while I was, uh, let's say, uh, listening to your presentation, uh, Descartes, let's say, uh, famous quote just popped up in my mind. Uh, because uh, I think when we read something or when we uh, hear something from media, I think we should first, uh, I think we should approach this with some doubt, with some skepticism. Um, Descartes once said that if uh, I doubt, then I think. If I think, then I am. If I am, then God exists. So he, uh, let's say, started from skepticism and, and tied it to the existence of God. What, I'm, what I mean is I think everything starts from being some kind of skeptical, having some doubts, or asking ourselves if this is like that. We, if we stop asking questions, I think we are going to be easy to manipulate it. I think uh, these, let's say, uh, some, for example, um, focus groups or power groups are working in a very professional way to manipulate masses and they have all the devices that they are using to manipulate my ideas and to hack my brain as a matter of fact but i am just an individual and i remember your your questions at, at your first slide there are lots of questions but as an individual only myself how can i manage all these things and if this is uh, true or false from each organization this was made and who sponsored this part of information etc when I look at the general uh, profile of people, and, and many people even do not think about such things, but they tend to believe in uh, actually whatever they hear or see from, from media. So it's going to be easy then for these people and for these giant uh, organizations to manipulate people. Even I remember American elections. When there were some rumors about uh, Russians interference in American elections. It is proven, it, it is proven already. <laughs> you see, you see, I mean, how can you copy all these manipulations as an individual? How can I, what can I do there? What can okay. I do about that? Okay, the thing is, if you start with the basics, uh, I mean, the five core concepts and five key questions that I showed uh, at the beginning of the uh, presentation. Uh, those things are the most important things and they are the basis for other uh, parts or other questions uh, coming after them. Uh, when you start with them, you can instantly uh, transform your um, daily practices regarding the um, different types of media you are using, regarding the contents that uh, you are uh, consuming. And then you can understand how these types of things are produced and what are the things that the people who produce these types of contents after basically either financial gain or power and when you understand this you can easily uh, say that i don't need these types of content or contents uh, i may do without uh, these types of uh, 
contents, but I need to focus on me, uh, these specific things that uh, will be beneficial for me. What I'm talking about is basically uh, you need to find a way to uh, have a specific media diet for yourself. And uh, since you are a family man, uh, you need to uh, also have a specific diet for your family members, for your children, for example. After that, it's going to be easy. Uh, but most of the time, we tend to forget that uh, we are responsible the, uh, about uh, the people that we are sharing our lives with. Uh, if we know something important, if we, if we have the knowledge of uh, these types of uh, very important things regarding their lives or lifestyles and their, I don't know, um, behaviors. We need to be able to sharing these things with them. Uh, after that, it gets better and it gets easier and easier every day. Uh, that's what I can say. Um. Uh, Prof, may I make a, a small course. comment? Of course, of course. Um, Liz, I want to thank you very much for opening the, widening the horizon in the area of uh, media literacy. You know, uh, listening to you from beginning to end shows that uh, there's quite a lot that we over communicators and one thing I really want to take out of this is the fact that we as professional communicators have much more work to do, you know, to be able to help people navigate through all these problems that are facing them every day. I love your use of the phrase media diet. Mm -hmm. It's very important. And then also we as professionals, we need to help people to navigate these topics turbulent waters of misinformation and disinformation. We, we, it's really a responsibility that we need to take on. Because listening, to, listen, go, going through what you've been, you know, listening to the different aspects you have brought out, I'm a little uncomfortable that we're not doing enough. And the world is going to pieces on account of the freedom, the, let me put it in quotes, the kind of freedom people now have with information, you know. We, we need, need to have some responsibility, responsible freedom. I thank you very much. It's, uh, it has broadened my horizon, it has opened me up, and it will probably make me a more serious uh, journalist. Let me put it that way. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. The thing is, uh, most of the things um, start with the literacy uh, definition. And now we have this media literacy as the uh, in general, uh, there are discussions regarding the naming of this specific skills that we mentioned, but information and media literacy in general, or digital skills in general, they are referring these types of things uh, under different umbrella terms. And these should be taught beginning with the primary school. And okay. uh, unless we do these uh, things, uh, unless we taught these things to our primary school children. Yes, to have an inquiring mind. Yeah, yeah, they are not going to have that inquiring mind. Uh, eventually mm -hmm. they're going to use, they, they need to use when trying to compete uh, with other individuals uh, in markets, in, I don't know, job seeking, et cetera, et cetera. They need these types of things before they even uh, find themselves looking for uh, a job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you again. Uh, yeah, Prof, uh, yes. I dropped from the line. I'm sorry for this. And again, I'm okay. back. And I'd like to again share also a couple of uh, ideas of mine about this media literacy. So on the one hand, uh, I believe that media is uh, an integral part of our lives because uh, through media, we are provided information and data that we need. On the other hand, it's a platform open to manipulations. So we should be careful about this. Mm -hmm. 
on the other hand, also we have our own biases and, and prejudices actually. So when we hear something which might be against our own set values and principles, we are ready to directly reject it. I believe that we should be always open-minded and open to any kind of, let's say, suggestions or ideas that may come from our, let's say, opposing sides or, or, or opposing, opposing uh, let's say, people. So I think we should never be uh, bigots or prejudiced or, or biased against some kind of people. So if something comes from them, we shouldn't directly reject that. Um, what I'm what I'm thinking is that it's too difficult to not to get manipulated, but really to find what is right and what is wrong. It's also difficult actually to distinguish what is true and what is false. I mean, because we are bombarded from all different directions, from all kinds of information, and the people who are doing this are professionals. They know how to do this. They are professionals in manipulations, mm -hmm. and it, it means that uh, if not all the people, but at least I think some people in a society should be able to analyze all these news and then excel in this media literacy, and then should distinguish what is wrong but what is not, and maybe then they, they can also share this with the rest of the society because I'm aware of the fact that a vast majority of societies do not actually care about such things. They just accept things as they are. They do not bother themselves doing some research on such things, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But thank you very much uh, for, for your presentation. It's really uh, very much uh, educative uh, also for me. So as the moderator of this program, if you or other, other participants have some comments to make or, or some ideas to share, uh, they can do it. Otherwise, I'm going to close today's seminar. Hello. Yes. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And uh, I thank uh, Professor uh, Osman for that very good presentation. I am a finance person, and uh, I think uh, your presentation has op also opened my eyes to so many things. But. Um, I'm looking at when we were just making the presentation, uh, Madam Beatrice was talking. I was just laughing because I was looking at the fact that um, access to, because I can see her passion about what the professionals should do in this field. But um, when she was just uh, speaking, I was just laughing. I said, you know, our access now to electronic gadget has made all of us um, <laughs> professional uh, uh, media people. Uh, even when, when you when you post something online, for example, I've seen several, not once, that uh, even somebody will just conjure something together and post it online, and you begin to see everybody carrying it. Even the professionals, they begin to carry it as authentic news. Let me just uh, draw a mind back to there was a time um, during the Ebola crisis in Nigeria that um, I think one lady and her friend from the um, Federal University of Technology, Akure. They came up that they find a solution that if you got Ebola, all you need to do, maybe you have to be bathing with salt and all that. And before you know it, even salt became so scarce. A lot of people were buying salt and, and it went so viral that a lot of people were doing it until I think somebody got um, a skin problem and a lot of people started complaining that, are you sure salt can even prevent Ebola? Until the lady now came up and said, no, it was just a joke between her and her friend. But a lot of media professionals also carried it that, oh, this is, uh, it has been found. You know, media professionals, too, they don't go deep to find out. A lot of people now are doing lazy jobs. By the time you just a lot of people because they just want to post something online, they just catch for information here and there and there and there. Then they match it together and it becomes and they feed us with several information. I want things that the way we think, the way we relate, the way we do things to a large extent. I think the, that's why I love what uh, Madame said that the media needs to do a lot because they really configure us to think in a particular way, to see things in a particular way, to do things in a particular way. They are really the major, I can say, problem. Of, our, of okay. the current uh, face that we are, of the mm -hmm. current uh, this thing we are facing. Therefore, I, I want to just hand up, please. That uh, are you? Can we come up with? Uh, is it possible that um, there should be a very stringent laws 
or rules that we guide uh, okay. media work and if somebody <laughs> posts anything and uh, that's what let, I let want me, to just let me just uh, tell you something uh, after 10 years of journalists experience and ten, again more than 10 years of academic experience I can easily say that it's not possible for us to change the journalistic organizations and journalism practices of um, uh, many people but it is really really easy for us to change our behavior patterns our um, skills or advance our skills regarding these types of things and uh, to the people uh, in our families and around us, it is easier for us to influence them and let them learn or understand these things uh, like media literacy, fact checking, etc. And at least some of the things, uh, there is nothing small regarding these issues, even if they understand only five key questions. That's it. Basically, you can let them go their way and they can solve their problems themselves eventually if uh, only they understand the five key questions of media literacy. But it is not possible for us to change the financial structure of the media, the um, ownership structure of the media in different countries and uh, the government's ideologies regarding media, etc. It is really not easy for us to change. But of course, there are non-profit uh, organizations, NGOs, etc., working towards these types of uh, general changes, maybe universal changes. But again, this is a huge uh, Herculean task, even for them. Uh, for individuals, we can try to change, uh, beginning with ourselves individually, and then family members, and relatives, and people around us, friends, etc. This is a surefire way uh, to uh, reach the change we are expecting to see in the society in general and all around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof, for the response. Okay. All right, then. Uh, then I think it's time to conclude today's seminar. I'd like to thank, first of all, uh, Prof Osman for his uh, educative and, again, uh, horizon broadening uh, presentation. I'd like to thank also Prof. Beatrice for her comments uh, of the seminar. Thank you very much. Uh, Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Sunday, for your comments. Also, I'd like to thank yeah. especially Prof. Ibrahim for his participation in this seminar, even though we haven't uh, heard anything from, from him. Yes, <laughs> Prof. Ibrahim. Maybe you have something to share with us, a couple of things about the seminar and media literacy and fact checking. No, no, thank you. After Having a uh, presentation of professor of communication, I don't have any words to say. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. we thank you very much for your participation. Okay. Then it's time to conclude again. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation, for this seminar, and I hope to see you again uh, for other seminars as well. Take care of yourself and please be careful about COVID-19 as well. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah.